right, welcome to yet another fabulous Linux Zoo Crew, and today it is the Attack of the Show hosts. We have a number of topics that we are going to be discussing today, but before I begin, I would like to share a few words with you from our founder, Voltam. Hi, I'm Voltam, founder of the Linux Distro Community. The Linux Distro community is a place for people to hang out and discuss Linux, Linux distros, software, and open source. The Linux Distro community is a community funded by its members for its members. We are a friendly, welcoming community that encourages people who use Linux operating systems and software to share their passion and knowledge with other people. We believe that when people share information freely, everyone benefits. Our community is also a great place for people who have been using Windows and have been thinking of making the switch to a Linux operating system, a place where they can benefit from the sharing of knowledge. Linux operating systems and software developers have given us all the ability to choose from hundreds of free Linux-based operating systems and thousands of free programs. The least we can do is freely share our knowledge and share with others our experience whilst using this software. If you are using Windows right now and have had enough of all the viruses, spyware, malware and are thinking, there must be a safer way to use the internet. Please consider using a free Linux operating system today. There are many to choose from. Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Pingai OS and Zorin OS are just some of the more popular easy to use operating systems. And for the person who wants more of a challenge from their Linux experience, there is also Arch Linux. Millions of people only use their PC for internet, social networking, voice and video chat and email. If they only knew that you can do all that on a Linux operating system safely and securely, that's where a community like ours comes in. Not only are we passionate about Linux operating systems and free software, we want other people to feel the freedom that we do when we use our computers. This is all part of a bigger picture. That as humans, we are rewarded by helping others. We were born to share and promote freedom. We'd love to see you become a part of the Linux distro community. You can voice chat with us on Mumble or text chat with us in IRC. Head over to linuxdistrocommunity.com for details. Join in today in the sharing of knowledge and the freedom that a Linux operating system gives people. Thank you. All right, and before we begin, I would like to pass the microphone over to our co-host, Pingcasts. Thank you, Spatry. Today, Zoo Crew will be featuring our scale. What's up, Spatry, Techman, the Linux guy, Edward, myself, Sekka, and Toss today. Hope you enjoy yourselves and get ready for uh, an attack of the Linux show host. I'm going to pass the mic back to Satchery. All right. And we've got a lot of hot topics that we are going to discuss today. Uh, one of the newest topics that just came out, everybody knows that the GIMP has just released version 2.8. They have now uh, switched over to a single user interface that you can choose optionally, of course. And uh, Oskolitz is going to go ahead and start us off with that. Yeah, I've been using uh, GIMP for a very, very long time now. I'm a professional photographer, as I'm pretty sure I've mentioned in the past. So image editing is something I do like every single day of my life. I'm quite impressed with 2.8. I've been using it since uh, beta, the beta of 2.7. So I've been using that series, which is the beta and alpha versions of 2.8. And I've been impressed the whole way throughout. The big thing, of course, is the single user interface. It's, it's a godsend. However, I do have one fault in them. They have it set, so on default it has the three panels, so you have to go up and change the settings. So, it, But it's not very hard, you just go up and click the Windows tab, and you can go single Windows mode, which is the best, the best option in my opinion. It's fast, stable, and it's going to be better than Photoshop. It's already better than Photoshop, because one, it's free, and two, I can do everything I can do in Photoshop and more. The only drawback that I see to this is the fact that if you're used to using programs like Photoshop or uh, even fireworks in my case you know finding those commands that you're used to using are a little bit harder now uh, I had a chance to play with the new GIMP yesterday and I even did a uh, just a short little video review on it I like the single uh, the, this the single application window layout of it and uh, now it's just a matter of taking the time to actually you know learn the different commands and you know 
pretty much it's like pretty much it's like learning how to use a new piece of software all over again now I'd like to pass the microphone over to quits up he said he had a chance to look at this I believe I had a quick look today um... I didn't realise initially about the single window where you had to set the option, but uh, once I did it, uh, yeah, it's looking good. Um, I never really liked the separate interface where you've got the two bars on either side. I'd always end up closing the wrong one, so anything that makes my life simpler all, is all good to me. Good. Edward. Yeah, they've done a really nice job with the um, 2.8 um, issue of GIMP. Um, they've added their own little n nice effects like canvas text editing and multi-column dock windows. Um, and then there's a new set of brushes as well. And they've also probably done some bug fixes and all that lot. Um, but it is, like you say, it is a pain to have to go to Windows, click on Windows and then go on to uh, single window mode. That should really be set by default. But like you say, as long as you make people aware, then people will be looking at your channel and taking your advice. Uh, awesome. Uh, it, uh, I like the idea of being able to have a, uh, a single windowed mode because it, it's. I personally find it annoying to have all these different windows open. As as Fachi was saying there, he wants to, to learn it and he, at the moment he finds it a bit difficult. And that is the thing about image editors. There's no way to make it, it easy. But by introducing this new feature of the single windows, it makes things easier for people who are brought up with Photoshop. I mean, I've heard of no lessons at my local college that teach how to use the GIMP. It's how to, how to use Photoshop. That's what they teach. So if you're taught how to use Photoshop, you're pretty much used to that one single design. And now if you have the option to use a free piece of software, you have the same layout. So you're, you're used to it. So it makes things a lot easier for people. That's what I find anyway. It, it's great. It, they've actually listened to people. People have wanted it, and they've listened. Setka. Well, I actually haven't had a chance to play with the new GIMP yet, um, but it, in my personal opinion, and I was taught how to use Photoshop, I actually prefer um, on dual screens to have the split windows, um, especially with my uh, tablet. Uh, um, and because my screen resolution isn't all that fantastic and having both screens at different resolutions, it makes life a lot easier for me to have on my bigger screen the actual editing window and then having the uh, other, like the uh, paint brushes and all that other stuff on the other screen and navigating around with the tablet becomes a lot easier as well. Um, so I'm not 100% sure what everyone's on about with the, you know, I learned how to use Photoshop, so GIMP's hard, but, um, you know, that, in my opinion, I, that, that's how I, I like the GIMP, and I like the GIMP for having those split panels over Photoshop just being one single window taking up uh, too much real estate on a single pane. So, at least, at least, you know, you have a choice. You can have the multiple... Uh, you can have the multiple windows, or you can have a single user interface. But the thing is, I, I think most most of the people that I've spoken with would prefer to have the application in in the form of a single user interface. But it's all about choice at the end of the day. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next topic. And uh, this next topic, um, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of Ubuntu 1204. And uh, Total OS today and QuidsUp have had plenty of opportunities to uh, use the new um, Ubuntu 1204 as these they are both running these on their main machines. Let's start with you, Total OS today, and then afterwards I'm going to pass the microphone over to Quitsa. Thank you, Spatry. Yeah, in, in a word, uh, Ubuntu 12.04, in a word, impressive and, of course, stable. I've had this installed in my older laptop, a Centrino M, and really since Alpha 2, and I normally don't like to mess with Alphas and Betas, uh, especially for new dual booters, it just wouldn't be smart. But for myself, since Alpha 2, wow, it's, uh, it has the look and feel of quality. It's, it looks great. It functions great. Now, I haven't tested every single piece of software. Um, the only glitch I found, everything seems to work terrifically the only thing in the multimedia you know and I think Linux perhaps needs to catch up I was trying to uh, transfer some DV video of me and my boy from a um, old DV cam uh, using the firewire and I downloaded I think it's called Kino I got it working and it's fine but besides that I dare say now let me say this first before I can say this 
my uh, my laptop has an Intel graphics card, okay? And that's all I'm gonna say on that. But at least on my laptop with that specific graphics card with Ubuntu 12.04 and me casually playing with a lot of the software, not every single piece, but at least with what I've seen and how it's been stable for me, I think Ubuntu 12.04 probably sets the new standard of quality for a mom and pop Linux based operating system. I love it. Quid's up. Yeah, so I got around to installing Ubuntu 12.04 at last. I was a bit annoyed really. I was almost forced down this route when my 11.10 installation broke up. I think it was just uh, completely overwhelmed with the amount I'd installed on it over the past six months. And I know at one point I had over 100 gigabytes in the recycle bin. So whoops, um, not surprised it broke. Anyway, my experiences with 1204, initially, I was quite impressed with it, thinking, oh yeah, the speed is brilliant, and they've done a really good job here. And then I started actually using the system, and I'm thinking, hang on, some of the things I used to do in 11.10 seemed a lot easier, and some of the effects you had in Unity, like the Dodge Windows effect, and also some of the colours, it just seemed a lot better in 11.10. So I've had to look at alternatives there, and got most of it now. But the big problem I noticed is if you install the GNOME Classic desktop or even the GNOME Shell desktop, it causes massive stabilisation issues with the NVIDIA and the applications. And, you know, it was like a completely different system after I put on the GNOME desktop. It, it was crashing, or it crashed immediately on boot up, and then every couple of applications would crash. But as soon as I realised, I thought, right, I'll start again. This time, don't install the GNOME desktop, and it, it's actually been pretty good. A couple of other problems I've had getting the screencasting going, but now that's sorted, uh, actually it turns out the screencasting's coming out a lot better in 12.04. Total OS today. Yeah, I'm sorry Quits had some issues. Again, let me restate what I said, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny, but my laptop has an Intel graphics card. I tested a Kazam screencaster, it works fine. I do have, uh, I think I have GNOME Shell uh, installed. Uh, you know, and I'm able to log out and log in. I think I even have Cinnamon, and it seems fine. But then again, I have the Intel graphics card, and, and it seems that history has shown, and maybe you guys can correct me, history has shown that Linux seems to prefer Intel graphics cards. And maybe that's the disclaimer that we should say that if anybody has ATI or NVIDIA, and not Intel, you may run into issues at least until... until the rest of the software and drivers updates catch up with the core operating system itself. But in my laptop, and it's an old one, look, it's outdated, but it works, it's stable, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've been thoroughly impressed. Linux guy. Yeah, Ubuntu's really doing well. Um, it kind of it kind of is a little bit unstable at times, but if you work around the stability things, then you're fine. Also, what I really hit hard on Ubuntu 12.04 is its lack of a task manager. And it's that really bothers me. I mean, that really bothers me out. It just is, you know, I mean, every, when you're, when you're uh, you know, doing uh, things like, uh, well, when a program crashes, I mean, you can't really go to a task manager to, you know, to close that program like you can in Windows. But there are there are a couple of good things about Ubuntu 12.04, and it's it has pretty good stability overall. Probably like, I mean, programs are pretty stable 80 to 85 percent of the time. All right, and a tip I have for you, Linux guy, is you could install HTOP and run that from a terminal, and then you would have a, a quick and easy to use uh, task manager where you can kill any programs that are misbehaving. Setka, your turn. Okay, so I haven't had much to do with Ubuntu itself, but I have been playing a lot with Edge Ubuntu since uh, our show on Ubuntu last week, I think it was. Um, and I've been looking at it from the administration perspective, uh, so seeing how easy it would be for someone uh, that isn't very Linux handy to walk in with an Edubuntu CD, stick it in a computer like a teacher or um, you know uh, something like that, stick it into a, a, a computer and set up things like LTSP for uh, which is Linux terminal server protocol. 
um, for setting up things like DIM clients in a classroom, um, all this sort of stuff. And I've actually found it to be incredibly simple. Um, the installer pretty much does everything you need it to straight off the bat. The only things that I've really had trouble uh, working with in Edubuntu is um, making things invisible to the theme clients. So uh, things like the um, settings for the machine for a start. Also um, like hiding things like the terminal and stuff like that because you don't want your students getting in there and messing around. Um, or even just restricting them right back to you know a few very very basic commands um but ev besides that um and the few odd crashes here and there um everything seems to be really well and i think they've done a really good job with 12.04 all right now riley had mentioned that he had an issue uh, with installing uh, the Kubuntu desktop and really bad overheating and that sort of thing. Now, it is my understanding the last conversation that we had with uh, Mr. Pope uh, when we had the Ubuntu show on uh, the Zoo Crew that they've actually made some improvements on that. Now, my recommendation in a case like that is if you really want to run a KDE desktop with Ubuntu is actually installing the uh, Kubuntu uh, op operating system, just backing up your home directory so that you have all your settings and that sort of thing, and then just restoring your home directory back once you have uh, Kubuntu uh, properly installed. Techman, you're next. Yes, Battery, um, thank you. I have been using Lubuntu 12.04 uh, since it came out and I upgraded to it. And I must say that it is pretty stable. I haven't had any real issues with it, um, except that my login manager changed, which I think was a fault of myself, uh, not knowing which login manager it used. I think that was my fault. But my SSH and my FTP server still run, even from outside of the actual user environment. So when it comes up asking me to log in, my SSH and FTP still work just fine for me. Now, something to keep in mind, folks. The Ubuntu 12.04 just released. This is a long-time release product. And it is my understanding that there are going to continue to be updates to this to improve reliability and stability on this operating system. After looking at this myself I feel that Ubuntu is definitely heading in the right direction there have been a lot of improvements to the unity interface I feel it is a lot more usable and it is welcoming to people who you know want to try an alternative to Windows and Oscalit you're next as, as everyone kind of knows, I'm not a big fan of Ubuntu, but that is for one reason. I am an advanced user. For beginners, Ubuntu is the best thing since sliced bread. It's got everything you'd ever need in there by default. It's got your, your browser, your text, editors, everything, everything you ever need. As an advanced user, though, I think Ubuntu is overly bloated. And that's the only downside I can really give it because it does have a great community that has lots of questions already answered. So if you have a problem with Ubuntu, I can guarantee you someone else will already have had that problem and you can sort it out, which I think is the great thing about Ubuntu as a desktop computer operating system is the fact that you have the information sitting for you. It's what makes Linux great for the beginners. It's what gets people interested in it and gets them using it. Exactly. Now, something I'd like to point out, because when I started uh, using Linux and I decided to switch over, you know what? Every problem that I had with Linux was easily answered on Ubuntu's forums. And, you know, just simply using a Google search, I would just simply type in Ubuntu and what my problem was, and I would always find an answer. Nine 95% of the time a solution to the problem that I was experiencing and that is a wonderful thing about the community because there are people that spend a lot of time on those forums answering newbie questions it helped me to learn and uh, that's one 
one reason why I decided to make this level of a contribution to the community myself, because when we share with one another, as Valtim has always said, everybody benefits. And uh, I, I, I really love what Ubuntu has done for the Linux community, and uh, it is my hope that we will see many more innovations and new improvements coming to the table. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on to our next topic, and this one uh, is uh, from Setka, and he's going to talk about servers and LAMP. And before we go into that, I'd like to explain to you you guys what LAMP really is. And basically, LAMP is an acronym for a solution stack of free open source software, referring to the first letters of Linux, Apache HTTP, HTTP server, MySQL database software, and PHP. Why don't you start us off on that topic, Setka? Okay, so I get a lot of questions about servers on IRC. I get emails about it every now and then too, and I get a few comments on YouTube as well, uh, and private messages there as well, um, asking me what exactly is needed to run a server. And essentially, the easiest way of putting it is any machine can be a server. You don't need to go out and, and buy blades and, and rack drawers and all this really expensive stuff. Anything can be a server. Um, and uh, if you, it depends on what you really want to do. Uh, if you just want to host your own website, then you can get away with very easily a machine with a, a, an old machine uh, with you know maybe a, a two three gigahertz processor. Uh, well, even lower than that, I, uh, um, you know maybe one and a half one one and a half gigahertz processor and two hundred and fifty six megabytes of RAM, because LAMP really doesn't use that much. Uh, resources as far as CPU and, and RAM goes, depending on the server load, of course. I mean, if you're getting smashed by a million users a day, then uh, you're probably going to find it to be a little bit ina inadequate. But um, at, on, a, on a general rule, it is quite possible to run a, uh, a website that's getting a decent... I, I reckon you could probably take about 100 hits to... <clears throat> Pardon me, a hundred hits to five hundred hits an hour on that sort of um, on that sort of hardware, um, and essentially the the process of installing and configuring LAMP is um, making sure that all the uh, the software can talk to it uh, talk to each other. Essentially, I mean, um, you've got to make sure that um, you know uh, Apache can see the PHP and MySQL libraries, and you've got to make sure the PHP can see the MySQL libraries as well, and make sure that um, you know Apache has all the right prefixes for if you're programming in in PHP. That um, you know if you have a file called index.php, that Apache knows that that's exactly the same thing as having an index.html, index.xhtml, or whatever. Um, that the process of setting up the server is really quite simple and um, it doesn't matter what distro you're on um, there's usually pretty good documentation for that distro um, but if you really can't find anything I really do suggest the uh, LAMP article in the Arch Wiki because it's fantastic. All the commands should be pretty much the same um, the only variation would be obviously package management um, if you're not using Arch and um, maybe some of the directory structure might be a little bit different. Um, as a general rule, everything should be almost exactly the same. Um, the other thing I wanted to cover as well, and because I've seen a few questions on, uh, on this as well, is sharing folders across a network, either via a, a, like just a normal computer or a laptop, or a server, because I've got you know I've got um, shared folders on my servers and my NASs and all that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of people get have the misconception that Samba is the only way to share um, files on a, on a network. While Samba is without a lot of um, mucking around, uh, Samba is the only way to uh, share files on a network if it's a Windows network um, because Samba pr is pretty much the protocol that Windows uses for sharing documents over a network. Um, 
But if you're going into a Linux environment where 95% uh, of your machines are Linux or more, um, you, you'll probably want to use NFS, um, which is network file system. Um, basically what it does is it creates a, a share that you can then mount that it's either a folder or a complete drive and you can mount that drive to any number of computers all at once um, which is also possible with Samba but NFS does it a lot more efficiently and there's not as much overhead because there's no uh, having to change for different protocols and and all that sort of stuff so um, if you're just sharing between Linux machines, then NFS is definitely the way to go. Um, yeah, but if you have to share between Windows machines and Linux machines, then uh, you're obviously going to need Samba. All right. Now, there have been a lot of really, really good comments that have come in as you were speaking. And I have a question I would like to uh, ask myself about running a server. Because for somebody like me, you know, I've never set up a server. And Linux is definitely the way you want to go if you... Uh, uh, wanted to run a server from your home. Okay, first, uh, let me read to you some of the comments that have been uh, mentioned on uh, IRC, and then uh, I'll move on to my question for you, Seka. OptiChip uh, mentioned that he would recommend using good hardware if you're going to be building a server uh, that is good to be accessed via people on the Internet. You want a machine that is responsive. And then Hi6 went on to say, uh, Raspberry Pi and then of course quids up went on to say that Raspberry Pi would struggle so I'm getting an idea here of how much processor speed we would probably want maybe uh, what would you say the minimum system requirements should be f to run a modern server and additionally how about bandwidth requirements okay so to run a modern server, to be able to keep up with uh, downloading and uploading all the time um, and, you know, large amounts of read and write and processing uh, for things like Minecraft or, or whatever, uh, I definitely recommend, you know, a minimum of 2 gig of RAM and at least a 3.2 uh, gigahertz processor. Uh, you'd probably be able to get away with a 2.8, but uh, a 3, 3 point something would be definitely better for obvious reasons. Um, the Raspberry Pi would uh, host a LAMP server with very little issue, um, but like I say, once you get into the point where you're getting large amounts of hits, your processing power and RAM usage is going to go quite high. Um, there was one other question there, Spatry, and I've forgotten it. What was it? Sorry. <laughs> I think you actually answered all of the questions, and uh, I think it was bandwidth now uh, that, that I wanted to cover because, for instance, somebody like me, I'm using Xfinity Internet, and part of their agreement is that you're not supposed to use your home Internet connection as a server and that sort of thing. Uh, but most importantly, what kind of bandwidth would you recommend to somebody like me who, let's say, I just want to have my own page. Okay, I've got an old computer that I've got set up. It's It's got a uh, 2 gigahertz processor. It's got 2 gigs of RAM. Would this be something sufficient for me to launch my own website and that sort of thing? I've got cupoflinux.com and just having that point to the IP address that is assigned and that sort of thing from my ISP, would that be something that would be sufficient or do you, are you suggesting that I have something a little bit faster? No, that should be perfectly fine to run it and um, I'm pretty sure most ISPs will have some sort of uh, term or condition that says you can't run servers off their, um, like a, off a home internet connection um, and a lot of people misconceive that as um, you're not allowed to run a server full stop which is um, not true. 95% um, of the time it's not true. Um, what they're talking about in those sorts of things are high-end servers and um, you know very large farms or even not so much very large farms but you know something that's getting smashed um, a lot so like a website that's doing uh, that's got you know six or seven servers running it and uh, you know you're pulling in five or six million hits an hour or something like that, like the Pirate Bay or something like that. Um, you know, that that would be what they're against because it is a home uh, connection and uh, everyone else that 
uh, uses the home connection on your exchange to suffer because of that traffic. Um, as far as bandwidth goes, depending on what you want to do, um, so just hosting, um, you know, cupoflinux.com, saying you get maybe uh, 300 hits a day, uh, you, because uh, HTML is pretty much just plain text um, being sent via um, the internet, your browser is what renders it and makes it look pretty, but um, and depending on how many images you've got and stuff like that inside the, uh, the HTML and whether the uh, images are hosted on your server or something like a photo bucket or Imgur or something like that um, would depend on how much bandwidth you're going to use. But say you've got a one-page website that has uh, you know just a cup of Linux and you put each week's um, video on there that's hosted on YouTube and it's got one picture that's one megabyte and the video is hosted away from your website so that doesn't affect your bandwidth. Um, so the, the text inside the HTML document is probably only about 100 kilobytes. So there's 1.1 megabyte uh, for your entire website. You take 300 hits a day, that's uh, three uh, or just under 300 and 30 hit, uh, megabytes, I think, something like that. So if you've got somewhere along the lines of two, three, four hundred uh, gigabytes bandwidth per month, you're going to um, uh, make it very easy to run that service. Um, that's, but that's not including your normal usage for things like game, Facebook, and all that sort of stuff. But ideal, uh, they don't use a great deal of bandwidth either. But you've got to be kind of smart about what you put into a, a home-hosted website based on what type of bandwidth you're getting. Um, so I definitely wouldn't recommend running an Arch mirror off a 200 gig uh, connection or a Ubuntu mirror off uh, a 200 gig connection like I do because I'm spastic. But you get my point. Like it. it it really, really kills your bandwidth, mm -hmm. and it really does it uh, really quick if you start going too big. I gotcha. Okay, now Oscalit went on to say that the configuration settings that I was suggesting would be okay, but speaking about the ISP situation, uh, is the data thr throughput that your connection takes. And uh, he also went on to say that if I were utilizing too much bandwidth, then they would probably talk to me about upgrading my internet package. And if I were to actually uh, decide to take one of these old computers and set up a server, obviously I would... Uh, uh, actually use a business class account rather than a home account. Now, you also went on to mention, and I wanted to move on to your next topic before uh, the next thing. You've made a contribution to the Arch community, and you actually have an AUR server. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so um, as far as the actual server goes, I have it. Um, I have every single PKG build on the AUR. Uh, the problem is that I don't have is I don't have the bandwidth to build every single PKG build on the AUR. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm filtering through all of the G builds that I do have, um, and picking out what seem to be the most popular via um, the comments on each package and, and whatnot. So, <coughs> pardon me. I'm, I'm going through and sorting through all the PKG builds um, to be able to build these things. The other um, really complicated thing about it is there is no easy way to automate the downloading of all of these PKG builds. I've got that bit sorted, but the other complication on top of that is um, building them uh, all to, uh, so that, you know, you build one PKG build and when that's done it moves on to the next one and so on and so forth. Um, you have to create quite complex bash wrappers um, to be able to complete that sort of process and um, at the moment I just don't have time to write it. Uh, the other thing like I say is when I start building these things um, I've also got to be very mindful of my bandwidth as well because I've got the obviously the full arch mirror here and I've also got to worry about um, you know the downloading of the source for all of these PKG builds and then Obviously, the redistribu redistributing the um, the packages that have been built back out onto the internet via the uh, the repo. So 
At, at the moment, it looks like I'm going to have to put that one on a staller until I can afford um, some dedicated hosting with some good bandwidth and hard drive space um, to be able to, to do that, um, minus a few of the really, really popular packages, and people are more than welcome to suggest packages to me. So basically, in layman's terms, for those of you who are not understanding what uh, Seca is doing here is, he's actually placed pre-compiled packages, I, I'm guessing, into his AUR. And basically, this allows you to download these and install these without ha actually having to compile all of these packages on the fly. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, that's correct. All right. Now, Techman has something he would like to add. Thanks, Use Battery. Um, I am hosting an FTP server off of my internet connection, and it is a private uh, FTP server. I have it set to where uh, if you want a connection to it, I have to set you up a user account, and you get a username and password, and you type in FTP colon forward slash forward slash, and then the IP address, and <clears throat> it is running off of a 1.5 megs per second download and a 0 0.5 megs per second upload on an old machine with a 1.86 gigahertz processor and two gigs of RAM and is running all right. All right, so any hardware that I'd have lying around right now at this point would be sufficient for running a server then according to what you're telling me there. Yes. Interesting. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on to uh, the next topic, and this one should be of interest to a number of you people, and this one comes to us hot from the press on the Mook T-Ware website. And this is Motorola gets Windows 7 Xbox banned in Germany. Let me read this article to you. I couldn't believe it when I read this. Microsoft has now tasted its own bitter pill as Motorola has succeeded in getting its Xbox and Windows 7 banned in Germany. U.S. International Trade Commission last month issued a preliminary ruling that Microsoft's Xbox 360 infringes on four Motorola patents. Microsoft may face ban on Xbox 360 in the U.S. as well. The final ruling is expected later this year. When Microsoft has played bluff until now, settling cases outside the court, which also indicates that its patent attack on Android is bogus, Motorola is actually succeeded in winning the legal rounds on the basis of its patents. Now, uh, interestingly enough, this article goes on to say later on that Microsoft is running a kind of extortion racket attacking Android players to sign deals over undisclosed and bogus patents. Microsoft settled its lawsuit against Barnes & Noble fearing its certain defeat. The company paid Barnes & Noble Barnes & Noble 3 million and called it investment so that it can continue its attack on Android. These rulings in favor of Android could, should weaken Microsoft's attack on Android as its mobile platform has failed. Okay, very interesting topic here and you know, if this succeeds and they're actually able to ban Microsoft in Germany, it just raises a question in my mind, how many other countries may follow suit on this? And we had a really interesting pre-show discussion on this, and uh, there were a, a, a lot of different things that were said, and the funniest thing that was said was from Total OS Today, take it away. First of all, my son, what did my son say? Something like, if, if they really uh, banned the Xbox here in the States, well, I said, if this happens, I'm moving to Canada. And then my son says something like, uh, then the real black ops of, of the U.S. have to unite to prevent this. I'm saying, from my point of view, Halo <laughs> around the world have to unite. And finally, boo, Germany. No, I'm just kidding. I love Germany. But uh, this sounds so surreal. Like, they're, I mean, the world? Okay, for, Germany banned Microsoft because of some le legal shoot. You know, I mean, like, legal issues. But first Germany, then the world? I mean, wow. 
Well, like I said before, if they start banning it in like America and stuff, you're going to find that they're going to lose a lot of money, especially Microsoft, about all these Xbox Live subscriptions and people on YouTube are going to be thinking, oh, what am I going to do now? I can't upload any videos from Xbox Live and all that lot of stuff. So people won't be actively engaging for like Mishima and stuff. Um, at the moment, I think it's just going to stay in Germany if it actually gets passed. But I don't, I don't think the um, US will have it as well because I don't think they'll go down lightly. All right, and Riley on IRC said he is going to sell any Microsoft stock right now. <laughs> you don't have stock in Microsoft, do you? Pincast, you're next. It's just a sale of it, right? Uh, so you know, if you have an existing Xbox, you should still be able to use that, right? I imagine you still would be able to use that, yes. As people were saying there, in America, Microsoft not being able to sell their products in America, uh, I don't see that ever happening. First off, it's it's an American-based company, and I'm pretty sure the American government likes the tax they receive off that company, because as I recall, at one stage, Bill Gates was the richest man in the world, so I'm pretty sure his company paid a hefty tax to the American government, and they have to fund their armies and all that somehow. They have to fund the Black Ops to stop it, you know? Quids up! I do like this bit of news, because for too long, Microsoft have hidden behind their patents as a way of moving their operating system forward. They haven't done new technologies, new ideas, to the extent of other companies. Instead, they've hidden behind their patents and uh, attacked other companies that way. And now it's backfired a good one. So yeah, I do like that. It's quite amusing. Two things. First, quids, I thought I liked you. No, I really don't. I'm, j I'm just kidding. Well, all I can say is that uh, if it really happened here, which it probably won't, I cannot live without my Halo games. It's, um, it's, it's probably the one game I play all the time, so... Even if Xbox does get banned in the United States, um, or any other country for that matter, you've already got your Xbox. Um, when they rule against patents, infringements and things like that they don't stop them from being able to use them they just find them and make them pay out the company x amount of dollars or x amount of billions of dollars um so i don't think that the impact uh will be all that massive because microsoft can afford it um so the xbox itself and the xbox live um media will still more than likely exist they probably won't be able to expand on it or um, they will have to completely redesign it so that it doesn't infringe these patents after the um, after the fines and payouts are all completed. Unless Microsoft are going to gain any money from it, then I don't see why they'd do it. But maybe they might end up just cancelling any future subscriptions to Xbox Live or future sales of Xboxes or all, but... Like you say, they're gaining a lot of money and they're going to be benefiting from it if it continues to sell. If they don't, then they're just going to start losing money and they're going to come out with something stupid. In my opinion, um, Microsoft won't lose too much by this issue of Xbox being banned in Germany. They have uh, products all over the world in a lot of other countries, so this is just going to be a small dent in their budget, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, this is probably a good example where, you know, unless there's some blatant, absolutely blatant disregard for some kind of, you know, specific patent, I think companies need to somehow figure out a way to play nice. You know, play play seriously if you have to, but play nice. It's It's a small world. It's a global economy. And maybe companies, you know, long term, maybe they need each other somehow, some way to survive and prosper. So, you know, what, you know, what happened in Germany probably is a taste, you know, Microsoft getting a taste of their own medicine, probably deservedly so. But uh, it's, it's a little bit surprising. But hey, you know, I understand companies wanting to protect what's theirs. But, you know, think long term, think, you know, what's good for the consumer and maybe somehow balance what's best for the consumer, balance that in the interest of also, you know, being profitable, if, if, if that makes any sense. Now, could this be Microsoft's undoing? 
I have no idea. Is Microsoft slowly dying? I mean, obviously, uh, they're not gaining any foothold in the mobile markets right now. They've completely lost that. Android has a majority of the market share, it is my understanding at this time. Um, could this eventually lead to an end of software patents? Maybe that's something that is needed so that there is more innovation, you know, because right now patents actually prevent innovation if i wanted to create a piece of software of my own today okay obviously let's say let's say i just want to make a graphics program or a video editing software all right and i don't have a degree in software patents obviously i'm going to be including technologies in my video editing software that i'm designing that's going to step over somebody else's patent and then legally they can take me to court and you know sue me out of all my money and you know prevent me from releasing something that's going to help people you know and so really I think that doing away with software patents is really going to help innovation in more ways than than I can think of I don't think there is a an easy solution is there Spatry I don't think there is right now, but the thing is, all these little tidbits that we're seeing in the news today, it's just a sign of the times. Eventually, you know, a system that doesn't work is eventually going to crumble, and we may be seeing the birth pains of that happening right now. Well, it was said years ago, not that long, not that long ago, you know, that we are the modern Roman Empire. And of course, you know what happened to the real Roman Empire. I hope that's not the case, but yeah. As a as a great quote goes, the Rome the, uh, the Rome, Rome was built in the day. There is still room for improvement in our empire. <laughs> I can uh, I can see the light. Well, at least I have to try and see the light. But there is a light out there. Microsoft feels that's a light to me anyway. <laughs> I think Microsoft is making a huge mistake, I mean, in, in the way of making profits, because people use Windows quite a lot. It probably has, I think it has the biggest market share in the PC world. So if they quit marketing in it, and if they quit marketing their, one of their, or all of their products in one country, it's just, it's just going to downfall in their way of profits. Let me toss out some quick historical names real quick. Napoleon or Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler. You know, there is an there is an underlying human defect that even though we can learn from history, there is an inherent human defect that simply does not want to go away. And that's like when people or people or a, a single person or people are in a position of power, they want it all and history has proven that you can't have it all it's impossible but yet powers that be will try and ultimately they will fail and maybe they may take some of us with them that's the part i don't like but you know not to getting not to get too philosophical here but there is again that you know annoying human defect of ultimate power and empires that rise eventually fall <laughs> All right, gang. Well, I will say this has been a wonderful discussion, but before I finish this off, I do want to mention that Riley believes, and I subscribe uh, to this view, that the GNU public license is a wonderful solution, and I think that we should start seeing more software developers embracing this. Um, sharing ideas for the benefit of one another because when everybody shares everybody benefits I, I think that's great you know that the you know that people are out there sharing that is what the spirit of Ubuntu is you know um, so lots of good things that I've heard today on the show I really appreciate everybody for being here uh, unfortunately we have run out of time I'm gonna go ahead and pass the microphone over to Pincasts, who will take us out alright thanks for watching everyone and that was an attack of the Linux show host I really hope you enjoyed it and stay tuned for another one all right, thank you all of you for listening. Thank you to everybody in the studio here. Edward12, Oscalit, Pinkass, Quidsup, Setka, 
Tech Man, the Linux guy, and Total OS today. Thank you, all of you in the listening room, everybody who participated on IRC, and most importantly, thank all of you on YouTube at home who is listening to this show. Please be sure to check out all of the shows uh, that will be listed in the show notes. Every one of them is well worth your time. Check us out next Saturday night. We will have another Linux Zoo crew headed your way with more great topics. Today's show was brought to you by the Linux Distro Community. Visit us today at linuxdistrocommunity.com and chat with us on Mumble or in IRC on the Freenode Network in the Linux Distro Community channel. The Linux Distro Community. Freedom through the sharing of knowledge.